Hello everyone, I hope this video finds you well and safe. Uh, this will be our video for our lecture for Friday, April the 17th. We're going to continue uh, our discussion on the great opera writer Giacchino Rossini and also introduce to you the last of the great Viennese composers, Franz Schubert. Now I said on Wednesday that uh, Rossini is not a part of your book, but I chose to include him in my uh, presentation on the uh, the Romantic period because we hear his music so much and I've given you several examples on Wednesday of his music and I'm going to give you several more tonight and I think you'll find out that the melodies from his operas are, are quite familiar and we hear them a lot in in our everyday society in a lot of different places so uh, more on him in just a minute and then we will um, We'll finish up tonight with a, a short discussion on Franz Schubert, which you'll find in your book on page 226, and we'll talk a little bit about why he's important and his contributions uh, to uh, the Romantic period of music. But back to Rossini. Now, we talked about this immensely successful composer of opera, uh, such that he was able to retire at a relatively early age. Um, the opera, we talked about William Tell the other day, and that was his last opera, and that's mainly known for that wonderful uh, overture that we hear so often. Um, the opera is not performed that often, but the overture from it is is definitely performed. Um, these overtures were written by romantic composers as a way to get the audience to come in and sit down and begin, so they could begin the opera. And many of these uh, overtures are... Can, they're standalone pieces. They're often performed all by themselves, and in and a lot of times they're more exciting than the actual uh, uh, opera itself to me as an instrumentalist. But tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about another one of uh, Rossini's operas, probably his most famous one, and it's the one that's most uh, most widely performed. And this is the opera, The Barber of Seville. Now. The Barber Seville, the gist of it is uh, we're going to talk about just one character, and his name is Figaro, and he's, a, he's the town barber. But the barber in this society is a very important person within um, Seville, which is a city in Spain, by the way. Um, the barber, he is a barber, but he's also the matchmaker. Uh, he is the marriage counselor. He is the man who can get things done. He can grant you a favor. He can uh, deliver a message. So he's a man of many talents. And as I told you once before, um, I, when we, we back when we were studying the voices, I used a baritone, American baritone, Thomas Hampson, to play this uh, Figaro aria. And um, I told you about, you know, he's, he's kind of celebrating his his status at the beginning of this opera. You know, he's uh, complaining that he never has any time for himself because he's so busy dealing with everybody else's problems. But he's really kind of full of himself. But, you know, he's happy to do it. But uh, it's it's all kind of comic. But uh, Figaro gets caught up in a love affair between a young man, uh, a servant, who is in love with a... Uh, uh, member of a royal family and there's another suitor who is another royal and they're tr they each want to marry this uh th this woman and figaro gets caught up in between uh trying to play both sides of the fence with each one of those um so that's how his character he he is a main character in the opera but he he really gets himself in trouble a little bit because uh he gets uh caught uh, wheeling and dealing for both sides um, of the two gentlemen that are wooing this young, this young lady's hand. So anyway, it's a, it's a very commonly performed opera, but the music, I think, is super special. I've given you several little snippets. Um, again, we're going to hear from Bugs Bunny. Uh, it's, th this opera is used in several Bugs Bunny cartoons. Um, we use the Figaro aria itself a couple of different times, and then the overture for the Barbersville is something special. Also, it's a it's really a catchy tune for me. I really like it, and uh, again, we hear it quite often. So I want you to check out those uh, the videos that I gave you 
regarding Rossini's Barber of Seville, and we'll finish him up, and we're going to move on uh, to the last of the great Viennese, uh, the last of the great Viennese composers, Franz Schubert. So if you take a look in your book, I ask you to read about Schubert, and um, hang on a minute, let me get a couple things pulled up here. Schubert is a really interesting guy. Um, he was Austrian. He was born in, in born and raised in Vienna. Um, he was only 31 years old when he died, but he uh, created a huge amount of work in a very short period of time. Um, he was a rather odd fella. Uh, he preferred the company of painters and poets and other musicians. He wasn't very sociable. Uh, didn't hang out a lot with uh, the socialites of the town of, of, of Vienna. So therefore, that caused a little bit of problems for him in getting commissions and things, although he uh, he was fairly successful in doing it. He never really had a full-time job. He lived off the patronage of people that paid to have him be in their company because of his musical abilities. Um, like I said, he was 31 years old when he died. He died from complications from syphilis. Um, he was raised... Uh, in a boarding school. His his father was the headmaster of a boarding school. It was a very strict upbringing. And um, once Schubert uh, got old enough to basically kind of move out on his own, he began hanging with uh, hanging out with some uh, younger aristocratic people who uh, supported him. And they kind of got him in trouble. And like I said, you know, he died from complications from syphilis. So you can kind of imagine where he got the syphilis from. So uh, some of his dirty deeds, so to speak, caught up with him a little bit. And there really was no cure for this. So uh, it was uh, essentially a death sentence because there were no antibiotics to cure this disease back in the early 1800s. Um, Schubert was a very short man. He was only just barely over five feet tall. Um, and he did not enjoy good health like so many of these other people during this period of time. But enough about you know his physical and social characteristics. Um, let's talk a little bit about Schubert's music. Um, Schubert is, is known for writing some of those beautiful and original melodies that have ever existed. He also was a master of harmony. And uh, his music is very beautiful to listen to. Um, again, it's it's melodies that stick in your head. I've given you, I'm going to give you two links to listen to on him. One is a <clears throat> extremely well-known piece called Ave Maria. And it's not necessarily a religious song, although it, has religious connotations uh, with the Ave Maria being a reference to uh, uh, the Virgin Mary, you know, in the Christian faith. But Schubert himself was an agnostic. He didn't necessarily follow any sort of established religion, although he did believe in some sort of higher divine uh, creator, or, or, or being that uh, oversaw the universe. So it's kind of an interesting um, philosophy on his part because he did write a lot of religious tunes because, you know, those were part of how he made his money. But Schubert is most famous for writing a form of what we call German art songs or almost German pop songs, if you will. These were pieces of music that were chamber music. They were meant to be performed in people's homes. And these are uh, go by the name of the, the German art song. They're called Lieder, um, L-I-E-D-E-R. And he wrote over 600 of these songs. And he would receive some small compensation for writing somebody a song that was going to be performed in their home for some special event or either just entertainment. So that's a, that's a huge body of work. He also wrote nine symphonies, uh, just like Beethoven did. 
Um, one of his symphonies uh, is known as the Unfinished Symphony. Now, we learned in the classical period that most symphonies have four movements. Well, the Unfinished Symphony only has two movements, and there's a great deal of speculation of why there are only two movements. Um, some folks seem to think that there were originally four movements, but the other two, uh, the third and fourth movement, were lost or destroyed somehow, possibly in a fire. Um, some folks seem to think that the first two movements were so good that uh, Schubert decided they could stand alone by themselves and didn't need a third and fourth movement to, to say what he really wanted to say. And um, some other folks seem to think that he may have just grown disinterested in the piece of music and was never motivated to write a third or fourth uh, a movement for this uh, symphony. So um, this is his eighth symphony, and it's known as the Unfinished Symphony. It was written in 1822. Um, it's performed quite a lot by uh, professional orchestras around the world right now. He wrote 16 operas, although they're not performed very often. They did not feature the castrato. The castrato has kind of fallen out of favor. They're just not performed very often. They're not as popular as Rossini's operas are. Um, he wrote several dozen string quartets, and some of them are considered just like those of Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven to be some of the best ever written. Um, again, the string quartets, that, that's not really in my wheelhouse as a brass player. I don't know a great deal about them. Um, he was also an exceptionally talented uh, pianist, so he wrote a, gr a large body of piano music, too. Um, in these lida that he wrote, he created things called, um, he created sets of songs that went together, and they had some sort of common storyline or some kind of musical idea that linked the songs together, and these were referred to as song cycles. And Schubert is generally credited with being the first person to do that, you know, with these songs that he wrote. Um, many of the Lida that he wrote were based on poetry by contemporary uh, poets of the time. Remember I told you he liked hanging out with painters and poets and uh, other artsy type people. Uh, Goethe was one of the poets that he liked writing music. Um, so these Lida would be meant to be performed in someone's home. Some of them had some rather risque and kind of uh, morbid uh, topics. Uh, I'm going to give you a link uh, to a song that's referred to in your book, uh, the English translation of the title is the Earl King or the Elf King. Um, the German pronunciation is the Earl Koenig, and it's basically about this uh, uh, this cruel and uh, devilish type elf who would come and steal your soul. And it's a song, it has, it, as the song in your book talks about, a man is taking a very sick child, uh, th galloping through the night um, to... Uh, try to get the, the child to the doctor to save his life, and th there's a very forceful piano part that's going on uh, underneath uh, this song, and um, and the child keeps crying out that he sees the elf king lurking in the shadows, and he's afraid, and the dad keeps saying, so, no, don't worry about it. We're going to get you. You're going to be fine, but unfortunately, uh, upon the arrival at the, at the doctor, he finds that the child has died. And, uh, and he's afraid that the Elf King basically stole his soul. So what a, what a morbid song. But again, you know, it's, uh, it was all part of this romantic pop music that Schubert helped to create. So um, check that out. There's a listening guide for that in your book. Um, it is a kind of a frantic sounding piece of music. And uh, the piano part for this piece of music is extremely difficult. So, uh, but anyway, just give it a listen to it. It's kind of a crazy sound in tune, but you do have a listening guide that'll take you through, you know, what the German words mean. I, the, unfortunately, the link I have is an old link, and it does not have subtitles, but just follow along with the listening idea there. Um, okay, so these German art songs were basically written, the leader, uh, I'm sorry, the Lieder, uh, were for some solo voice and usually piano accompaniment. 
and um, they were meant to be sung and enjoyed in a home, not necessarily in a concert hall. So uh, you got two very, 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 um, two very different Schubert pieces, Ave Maria, which is very beautiful and very inspirational, and then you have uh, the Earl Kronig, which is uh, a, a very morbid, very sad type song about a, a tragic event. Now, I want to throw out another name here again uh, that he's kind of showing up again. Schubert, uh, his teacher uh, in Vienna, that the person that taught him composition was none other than a guy named Antonio Salieri. And we talked about Salieri being a friend and confidant of Mozart, and he was also the teacher that Beethoven went to after he had a major falling out with Haydn. So, uh, again, you know, he lived to be a very old man, so he had a, a, a big influence over, uh, just like Haydn, he had a big influence over the younger composers in Vienna. Um, ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> so, Schubert was never able to secure any kind of adequate permanent employment, and he spent the majority of his life relying on the support of his friends and his family. So your typical peasant musician, you know, he, he, he existed strictly for his art. And um, he was fairly popular at the time, but his music was only known to certain small circles. After his death, uh, he, his music gained a great deal more interest and has been fairly popular with musicians ever since. Now, two final things. Schubert admired Beethoven immensely, so much that he requested and was granted the permission and the privilege of being a pallbearer at Beethoven's funeral. Remember, Beethoven was given a state funeral that over 20,000 people attended. So uh, Schubert was a pallbearer. Uh, with his small stature and sickly state, I find it hard that he would be able to perform his duty as a pallbearer to be helped carry a coffin, but evidently he was able to pull it off. And then his dying request <clears throat> was that he be allowed uh, to be buried next to Beethoven, who was his idol, and that wish was granted. So if you go, if you ever have the, the chance to go to Vienna, there's a small park uh, in Vienna. They call it the Composer's Park. There are several prominent composers buried there, and you will see uh, Beethoven's uh, uh, grave, and you'll also see right next to it Schubert's grave. I will include a link in the, here in this, uh, announcement sheet with a link to a picture of these uh, tombstones for you to take a look at. But anyway, check out Schubert's music. Um, it's very pretty. I enjoy the melodies. Uh, it's something I can remember. And um, he had a lot to offer, especially as far as developing this German pop song, art song, uh, that became very popular after his death. So anyway, uh, there we are. And this is our lecture for Friday. Um, please, if you haven't read the email, uh, there's a chance for you to uh, do a concert review uh, by watching the uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, musical Phantom of the Opera. It's on a YouTube channel. I've given you a link to that. So check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. So anyway, stay safe. Have a good weekend. We'll continue our lectures on Monday. Uh, we will start somebody new on Monday. So take care, everybody. If you have any questions about the test that we just took, please send me an email. I will do everything with my power to accommodate you if you had an issue or a problem with it. But overall, pretty good job. I was very pleased. Take care, everybody, and we will see you on Monday.